welcome to my presentation on are you selling like your buyers want to buy now or as it says up here is your business selling how modern buyers want to buy and the reason I'm asking that is that the selling environment has changed your buyers have changed they've changed the way they buy and now our selling needs to keep up with it we need to adjust so as you can tell from my accent, I'm actually based in Sydney in Australia, but don't fret. What I'm going to talk about is going to be relevant very much to you and to your business. And I also service clients in West Coast USA and even some on the East Coast in New York State. So you don't, you don't worry that uh, because I sound a bit foreign <laughs> that uh, my talk is not going to be relevant to you. It very much is going to be re relevant to you. So. Let's talk about what uh, buyers do not like any longer. Now, uh, just ask yourself, do I like being cold called? Do I like being spammed with emails? Do I like being pitch slapped on LinkedIn? And we all know what pitch slapping is. It's uh, very much somebody reaches out to you under some pretext saying, oh, look, we've got some um, connections in common. Let's connect here too. And you go, yeah, okay, let's connect. Sounds friendly enough. And the very next thing they do is hit you up with a sales pitch. That's pitch loving. So cold calls. Do you know that um, only one to 2% of cold calls ultimately convert into appointments and that it now takes eight calls and all uh, contact um, attempts to reach a prospect um, as, a, as, as opposed to, um, you know, three and two thirds of cold call attempts in 2007. So people are getting harder to reach. People are getting harder to, to be contacted. Now, same with emails. The average office worker like you and me now receives 121 emails every day. That's just insane. No wonder we don't respond to those emails any longer. I mean, how many um, SEO um, offers can you get or how many um, invitations to um, to build an app for you, you know, it's, it's just insane. And of course, no one likes being ambushed by pushy salespeople. And I actually say it ruins the selling game for everyone. And, and why is that? Because you think about it, if everybody pitch slaps somebody on LinkedIn, if everybody spams people with emails, and if everybody cold calls their prospects without really knowing whether they're in the market for the thing that you're selling, the buyers are just going to retreat into their tortoise shell and say, stop it. I'm not going, I'm not interested and I'm not going to respond to you any longer. That's exactly what's happening. Buyers are retreating and they're getting ever harder to reach, which is then, um, is, is then um, uh, reflected in the sales results. So results as, as in sales cycles are getting longer. And in 2023 alone, we saw a 24% jump in the average sales cycle length, up from 65 days to 75 days. My, a lot of my clients and my American clients tell me that the sales cycles are getting longer and they don't know what to do about it. The other thing is that sales targets are being missed and you know that uh, quota attainment is, is much worse now than it was five years ago. And I'm actually surprised it's not much worse than 63% versus 53%. And, and it just means whatever we've done so far, whatever that worked before the pandemic in maybe 2017 or 18, is no longer working now. So it is harder to engage with modern buyers. It's not harder to reach out to them, it's just harder to engage them. So question to everybody here. Are you using this selling model? It's the well-known sales funnel. You know, we put leads into the top of it. We engage the prospects. We nurture the leads. Then marketing hands them over to sales and sales advances the sale, negotiates and ka-chink, ka-chink, a sale drops out at the bottom. Guess when this was invented. How long ago? Have a guess. Was it in the 1970s? Was it in the 1950s? Was it in the 1930s? Was it in the early 1900, uh, early 20th century? I'm gonna tell you. It was invented by an American, St. Elmer Lewis, in 1898. 
1898. Now we're not talking about 1998, we're talking about 1898, which means it was invented around the same time as the automobile. So you can see this family here on the left hand side enjoying their ride in their brand new automobile at the time. But if you're still using the sales funnel, you're relying on a 19th century selling model. I'll say this again. It, this, the traditional sales funnel is now 125 years old. In 2023, it turned 125 years old. And if you're still using this very sales funnel model, you are relying on 19th century selling thinking. So it no longer works. No wonder it no longer works. It's 125 years old. I don't know anything that's 125 years old that, um, that still works now today. So no wonder. The problem with it is that it's inward looking. It's looking at how we want to sell, what we want to sell, how we want to sell it. And the buyer is almost an afterthought. I mean, look at the whole thing. It's all about what we want to do. It's not about the buyer or what they want to buy. And the, the key thing here is that buyers no longer want to buy like this. They don't like it, yet we still do it. And it's not working any longer. And the answer that many organizations come up with is, oh, if it's no longer working, let's just do more of the same things that we know are no longer working. Now that's um, Einsteinian, you know, the, um, uh, the, <laughs> it, the, the definition of insanity is that you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Got it. You keep doing the same thing and you expect a different result. It's just insane. So let's not no longer do the things that we know are no longer working. So what we want to do is upgrade our sales funnel. We want to go from one on the left hand side that's seller or even product focused and use an upgrade path to move across to a sales funnel that's buyer focused one that works in the 21st century, that one that works right now, and one that's actually not that difficult to implement for you. But it, create, it requires a different perspective, a different approach, and different competencies. And you can see there are 10 competencies in the sales funnel on the right here that um, I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so the 20th century sales funnel will create a superior buying experience because it is focused on your buyers and how they want to buy, not on the sellers and how they want to sell. Plus it's structured. So it's, um, it, it, there's a, a, a process to bring it into your business that, that's very proven and, uh, and has worked. And it's also scalable, which means that as you hire more salespeople, they can all just step into the same sales process. It gives your customers a more consistent buying experience and it means that your new reps can ramp up much more quickly than if they have to work it out themselves, you know, how to sell um, and how, what your value proposition is and what, um, what your sales process is. Because you've got one already, you've got a pretty much a selling framework that they can just fall into. Like I said, there's 10 modern selling competencies involved in it. I'll elaborate on those in a minute. But it delivers, ultimately, it, it delivers you more sales and more sales faster. And it's 21st century thinking applying to selling and to your modern buyers. All right, so little intermission here for those people that don't have time to listen to the entire presentation today. If you scan this QR code or jump to this URL here, you can download a free checklist that checks your current sales funnel. And you can do that by yourself. It takes about, I don't know, five or 10 minutes but it's free and it gains you insight into what, where is my sales funnel at right now? Is it buyer focused? Is it seller focused? Is it product focused? And which of the 10 competencies in the buyer focused sales funnel do we have already in place? And where do we still have gaps um, that are opportunities for improvement? So I'll encourage you to scan the code or go to the URL and uh, download the um, free sales funnel checklist. All right, moving right on. The first competency is, of course, knowing who our ideal buyers are. So, so our, our ICP, our ideal customer profile. And I su 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 um, suggest that you use at least five different criteria to identify and define your ICP. 
uh, you know, typical things are job titles, locations, like where are they geographically speaking? What business, business size are they in? What industry sector? What, um, what interests do they have? And that's important because if you want to get, reach out to them and not just reach out to them, but if you want to engage with them, then you need to know what interests they have, what content they consume, which experts they listen to, because you can be then there as well. Which brings me to the next point. Once we know who they are, we want to know where they are. And so we say, you know, where do they hang out online or in person? What do they read? What do they consume? And who do they pay attention to? Like which experts? Because we can then align ourselves with those experts and, and uh, look like um, uh, some, something interesting for them as well. So we're looking at where they are in terms of the physical, the online, the virtual, and the third party access that we gain to them. All right. So it's important for us to have a brand promise. Now, whenever I talk to talk about a brand promise, marketers get very nervous because they hear the word brand and they go, oh, that's our job. What's uh, what's Peter doing there doing our job? You know, <laughs> and, and it's actually much more harmless than that. A, a brand promise is a short, succinct impression of what it's like for your customers to be your customer. What is it like to be your customer? And I've um, put um, a, um, a, um, a sample here, an example here for you, by a uh, Californian company called Aventi Group. Um, they do go-to-market strategy design. And they, came to me and they said, look, um, what, um, how can we differentiate ourselves from our competitors? And I said, well, look, when people are going online and they look for like a serv they look for a service like yours, they'll probably come across, you know, tens or hundreds or even thousands of, um, uh, of suppliers. One thing they were going to, uh, they will ask themselves is what is it like to be a customer of this organization? And you will be the only one that actually addresses that question and you will make it very obvious to see what, uh, what the customer experience is going to be like. So all my clients and I, we co-create their buyer-focused sales funnel, which means we work it out together. I don't tell them what to do. We workshop it together until we come to a result that we both like. All right. And in this case, with Eventi Group, the... By, uh, uh, the brand promise was a three word slogan and you can see it here on the screen. The three words are expertise, speed, results. Now you think about it, what it means from the buyer's perspective. I see that logo, I see those three words and I think immediately, okay, they know what they're doing because they've got expertise. They won't dilly dally around because they give me, um, they, they'll be speedy in, in what they do and providing the services and I'm going to get a great outcome, a great result. So just with three words, I go, that sounds interesting to me. I want to put them on my short list. So it doesn't mean that I've made the sale, but at least Aventi has come onto the, uh, onto the short list and they're going to be looked at more closely rather than being eliminated in the first stage when Aventi doesn't even know the buyer exists because they're still looking online. <laughs> I hope that makes sense to you. So it sets up the right buyer expectations what, uh, in terms of what it's like to be your customer. Nobody does it. I urge you to bring that into your business because it'll make a big difference to your sales and to your inquiries. Next one. It sounds very basic, it sounds very banal, but you need clear products and service descriptions. Because if your customers are not quite clear on what you're selling, and then they won't be clear on what they're getting, and they won't embarrass themselves saying, look, I don't understand what you're selling. That They'll just say, oh, look, it's not right for us right now. Oh, the timing's not good. Oh, no, sorry, it's not for us. And you will never know why you've lost the sale. So ask yourself, do our customers understand what we do for them? Or do we mainly talk about what we do and not what's in it for them and, and how we deliver it and what our products look like? So I say a confused mind says no, don't let them be confused. Be very clear about what your products and services are. Make sense? Next one. A very strong value proposition. And I, and I call it, um, I, it's called a unique selling proposition, a value proposition. I, and also, um, you need to create a killer introduction line 
that comes from your value proposition. And the value proposition is basically what makes us different compared to our competitors. Out of all the people that you can go to, Mr. Customer or Mrs. Customer, what makes us different so that you choose us, right? And also, how can we convey that difference, that value to our customers when they first contact us? So I talked about the brand promise before, but the value proposition is different to the brand promise. The value proposition is about what's in it for you, Mr. Customer, whereas the brand promise is about what's it like to be our customer. So I say what we need to do is at the first, very first point of contact, we don't need to pitch them. We don't need to sell them. We don't need to ambush them. We don't need to tell them how great we are. All we want to do is to show them that we're coming from a position of um, thought leadership and authority, domain expertise. And we want to say something to them that makes them lean forward. Something that makes them lean forward and say, oh, that sounds really interesting. Tell me more about that. And once they've asked us a question about, tell me more about that, they have inadvertently perhaps, but they have given us their permission to sell to them. And that's all we want. We want their permission to sell. We want them to lean forward and say, tell me more. We want them to get interested, maybe even just intrigued and engage with us because that's how you get engagement. Now, speaking of engagement, what we want to do is do more than just reach out to them. I mean, look, the technology, we can use all sorts of uh, online channels and uh, platforms to reach out to people. Like I said, uh, email, phone, social media, you name it. But buyers don't want to be reached. They want to be engaged. And so we, we create those lean forward moments by intriguing them with something that we say. So if you have a point of view, a perspective, a, a thought leadership that engages your buyers, maybe even something controversial, maybe even something that they say, no, that can't be right to. But if you just engage them and they say, that's, that's really controversial, I don't believe in that. Then you say, oh, why not? And they go, well, because it's rubbish, blah, 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 and you have a conversation. So even if they don't agree with your point of view, then you, you will enter into a conversation. You will draw them into a business conversation rather than a sales pitch. And of course, if they agree with you, even better because then you build rapport, maybe even trust. And I talk about that there are only three ways of engaging with senior executive buyers. The first two are difficult, the third one is uh, easier, and it's also more scalable. So the first one is that you make your buyer aware of a business opportunity that they did not know they have. You make them aware of a business opportunity that they didn't even know they have. You talk about the industry, you talk about trends, you talk about how things that, uh, what things happen to another client of yours that uh, is very similar to, to the buyer that you're talking to. The second way is to warn them of a risk that they didn't know they're exposed to. To warn them of a risk that they didn't know they're exposed to. Now, any C-level executive or, or even mid-level mid executive would like to be warned of, uh, of, of making a mistake. You know, because you, you, you come from a position of authority and, and domain expertise, you can say, look, other people in your, in your situation, they make this mistake and you can warn them off. The third way is easier and more scalable. And that is to help them to understand that they actually have a need for the thing that you're selling. To help them to understand that they have a need for the thing that you're selling. And you can do that by telling a story. And I have a, a three-step storytelling formula that um, I can talk to you about um, offline. 
basically storytelling is is very powerful because it's in our dna that we respond better to stories than to facts and figures you know when we were wearing in ca uh, living in caves and still wearing loincloths we responded to stories much uh, we, we 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 learned through storytelling so the elders would tell the youngest um, about things through storytelling and we'd learn through storytelling, you know, sitting around the campfire listening to a story. That's still with us today in our DNA because we, like I said, respond better to stories than to facts and figures. We can remember a story much more readily than we can recite facts and figures. So use that DNA to your advantage. Tell a story. Use my three-step storytelling formula. Very simple to engage your buyer and to draw them into a conversation, not the sales pitch. All right, so now once the customer has shortlisted or the buyer has shortlisted us, of course, we will not be the only one on the shortlist. There may be two, three, four, even four others that they will decide who gives them the best deal and who's the best fit to help them with whatever they're looking to do. Um, so how do we fend off our competitors and how do we end up as the last vendor standing that gets the deal? And I talk to my clients about bringing up the one subject, the one subject that your competitors will avoid talking about. And that subject is buyer risk. The risk to the buyer of getting it wrong because just like the person here on the screen you can see that the buyers are scared of getting making the wrong decision of getting it wrong and getting into trouble maybe with the boss or uh, or with the uh, the partners of the business or whatever a big decision an expensive decision a long-lasting decision is going to be pretty scary to make for your buyers so i want you to keep that in mind when you talk to your buyers to them but they're not ready to buy yet or they might be unsure of whether your thing is the right thing or you know whether you can actually um, gel with their culture or whatever it is but whether there's a good fit for you to, or not so keep in mind that they're scared of getting it wrong so if you can position yourself as a friendly party you know the old trusted advisor let's say where we figuratively speaking put our arms around the buyer and we help them to make the right decision and we help them to avoid make a mistake and we advise and guide them to a good outcome that's what they want and in the meanwhile while we're talking about buyer risk the competitors will say no there's no risk here don't worry about it um, nothing can go wrong trust us and and buyers don't really want to blindly trust somebody they have never met before trust a vendor with, um, with uh, their own agenda. What they want is they want to be guided and helped to make the right buying decision by somebody whom they perceive as a subject matter expert, as a domain expert, as somebody who knows more about the thing that they're buying than, than they do. So how do you fend off your competitors by talking about the one subject that they don't want to talk about, namely, buyer risk. So you, you talk about Mr. Customer, Mrs. Customer, would you agree that in every business decision that you make, there's an element of risk involved? Ah, it's a rhetorical question, right? So they would say, yeah, that's right. So, but they might be thinking like, where is this, where is this person going with that? And then you say, okay, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer, so you realize that in making this decision, regardless of whether you go with us or anybody else, there's an element of risk involved, right? Regardless of whether you decide to go with us or somebody else, there is an element of buying risk involved for you, right? And they go, yes, yes, there is, absolutely, yeah. Now I'm interested what you're gonna say next. And the next thing you're gonna say is, would you like me to outline to you how we help our customers to mitigate their risks? Wow, this person has not only said there's risk when everybody else has told me that uh, trust us, you know, and nothing can go wrong. 
but they're also going to tell me how they help me as a customer to avoid risk, to avoid getting doing the wrong, making the wrong decision, to avoid getting it wrong in the first place. And then you talk to them about how you help your customers mitigate their buying risk, and you talk about you know the your buying process, your, your sales process, or your buying process even better. You talk about your testimonials, you talk about uh, references, you talk about uh, referrals, you know, you talk about all those things that make buyers safer buying from you. And let's not forget, because they've said, yes, I'm interested to, to know how you mitigate my risk. Again, you're engaging the buyer in, in a conversation uh, that's actually a, a business conversation and not a sales conversation. So that's how you fend off your competitors and end up the last vendor standing who wins the deal. All right, let's talk about proposals. Now, I, I say to my clients, almost the worst thing you can do when somebody asks you for a proposal is to give them a proposal. Almost the worst thing you can do when somebody asks you for a proposal is to give them a proposal. Why? Because once you hand over the proposal, you've lost control over the deal. The buyer can now take their sweet time and go, oh, pss, 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 pss. and uh, before they come back to you, they might ignore all your, your, your follow-ups, uh, all your check-ins, uh, all your touching base calls, and they, they might just take their sweet time. In the meanwhile, we as sellers go, get nervous because we go, what's, what's happened? You know, we've given them the proposal and uh, I'm not hearing anything back. Have they, do they not like our proposal? Have they decided already to go with somebody else and just haven't told us? What the hell is going on, right? So let's have a proposal process that mitigates that. So I'm talking about a process here, not the proposal itself. Obviously, what goes into your proposal, the proposal content is super important. But there's also a way that you can present the proposal that gives you an unfair, unfair advantage and that gives you like two bites of the cherry, if you like. And that is this. You say to your buyer when they ask for a proposal, yes, thank you, Mr. Buyer, Mrs. Buyer. We'd love to give you a proposal. But at company name, it's super important for us to make sure that our proposals meet your exact requirements, that they are exactly what you're looking for. How about we meet on Thursday at 2 p.m., and we walk through a draft together to make sure that uh, what we're proposing is exactly what you're looking for. You're, you're talking about, I want to get it right for my buyer to make sure that my proposal is exactly what they're looking for, is exact, exactly right for them. It's not about, hey, buyer, can you help me write my proposal, which is what, it's, what it actually is, but it's about me wanting to do the right thing for the buyer one of two things will happen. Either the buyer says, yeah, that sounds good. Let's meet a Tuku to get it right for them. Brilliant, the, you qualify that deal in. On the other hand, they might say, no, nah, that's all right, Peter. Just send it through as it is. I don't need to go and look through it uh, with you. It's, it, it'll be fine. Now that might mean anything or nothing, but it could also mean that they're not really serious about your proposal, they just want you to be the third quote for them. Or that they've already decided to go with somebody else, but they're just, uh, for probity and governance reasons, they, they need three quotes. So, um, you can, with just that one little question, would it be okay to walk through the pro proposal, a draft proposal together, because we want to make sure it's right for you? We'll tell you a lot about what goes on behind the curtain at the customer end, at the buyer end, whether they and how serious they actually are about your proposal. Now, I've got a, um, um, another client in California who used this technique and they won a multi-million dollar project the first time they used this technique. So I encourage you to talk about, to think about your proposal process and not just the proposal itself. All right, this is very simple. There are seven, um, seven competencies or seven experiences that you need to provide to your buyer for them to have a good customer experience. 
and the good customer experience is going to be before, during and after a sale as well. Not just a buying experience, but a superior customer experience pre-sale, during the sale and post-sale as well. And you can, you can read the, three, the seven things out here. And I actually encourage my clients to print this out and stick it on the cubicles in the office so that people, when they answer the phone or when they interact with their customers, they can look at it and say, these are the way we do things around here, which is, uh, goes to your, um, to your culture, to your business culture. So the seven things are the way that we're going to treat our customers. The way we do things around here, that's our culture, that's our DNA in this business, how we deal with our clients and with our buyers and with our customers. So firstly, make me feel like I'm important. Maybe even make me feel like I'm in charge. Be very clear and honest and no sneaky tricks or surprises. No, no um, um, presenting one thing and selling another. No bait and switch, you know, none of that. Then keep your promises. If you make a promise, keep them. Don't give me problems, particularly, you know, don't tell me that your dog ate your homework. It's not my problem. Don't bring, make my problem, don't make your problems my problems. Don't give, I don't want to know about any problems and show me that you care, be fair. And if something happens, if something goes wrong, just own up to it, be quick to act and react and fix it. So there are seven very simple things that are probably not rocket science, but you've probably never seen those seven listed like you have here today. So again, feel free to use this, stick it on the wall at the office, Put it as your wallpaper on your on your um, device but make sure that everybody in your business gives your customers the same experience and follows the, the um, a consistent culture because that will give you new business and repeat revenue from your existing customers because they'll be such so happy with the experience that you're giving them that they'll come back for more and they'll be so happy that uh, about the experience that you're giving them so that they will also refer new business to you. All right, so, and, and uh, by the way, the previous slide also talks about then how to create referrals. And we know that referrals are the easiest way to generate leads and they're the most um, reliable leads that lead to a sale because somebody else has already pre-qualified you and said, these guys are all right to deal with. I recommend you talk to them. So referral selling is super, super important. Unfortunately, most organizations don't have a referral selling framework or a referral selling process. My clients learn how to build that into their business and get more referrals, measure them, manage them, win them. All right, so the question is, when was the last time we you've um, reviewed your sales funnel. Knowing everything that we've talked about here today, isn't it time that you review your current sales funnel to see whether it still stacks up for the modern buyer? So, I want you to scan this QR code or go to this URL and access my free sales funnel checklist. This is to help you to identify the gaps in your sales funnel and the areas for um, op opportunities for improvement, shall we say, for your sales funnel. And, uh, and you and I, we can then offline book a call and talk about your results. And I'll give you um, half an hour of my time to help you identify um, how you could do better, what, what you can do to better engage your buyers at the f top of the sales funnel, how to bring them through the, the middle, um, fend off your competitors and then be the last vendor standing that wins the deal and also gets repeat business from your customers and referrals from your customers so that you can put new leads in, into the top of the modern buyer uh, focused sales funnel. So I'm Peter Strokov. Please reach out to me. The website link is there. The QR code is there. Do it today and I look forward to hearing from you.